So this morning is a little different the way we're going to do things. Um, as many of you may know, we just got back from a mission trip to Ecuador. And so I've got a slideshow together. Frankly, it's probably way more than uh, I should try to get to today. And I left out a lot, actually. So uh, the other deal that I'm really bummed about is I plugged in some videos to the to the slideshow, and there are, we need to go buy a new computer like tomorrow because it's not working real well. We're going to give it a try, so we'll see how it goes. The last thing, too, is I, I typically have like a laser pointer or remote control, and I can't find it. So if anybody knows where it is or it's in the backs of any of the seats, just wave your hand. Let me know. Because uh, otherwise, they're going to have to drive for me. So uh, anyway, thanks for coming. Uh, let me get started by, we'll dive into this, and I'm sort of make it up as I go. Okay, here we go. So uh, as you may know, and I know some of you guys may not know, because I see some new faces, some old new faces. And uh, again, yeah, so glad to have you guys all. Uh, if you don't know where South America is, it's south of here. And Ecuador <laughs> is the little green dot over there on the left. And the word Ecuador literally means equator, because it's on the equator. And um, so the equator is just north of us. We were a little bit in the southern hemisphere. And, uh, and so anyway, you can see where it is on the map. And then here on the right is the, the little box and the highlighted areas, at least to some extent. This is more or less, I guess, the ancestral, the tribal lands uh, where the people that we were visiting um, predominantly live and, uh, and are from. And so next one. Okay, so this is our group and our team. Gosh, about two weeks ago when we were getting on a plane, to take off, you got me on the left, Dan Truckee and Jeff Banky. Je Dan is Jeff's father-in-law, Tracy Banky's father. And then we got Marlon Anderson. I know we're all hiding in masks. And then Ethan, my son Ethan, here on the right. And this is at the airport. Everything looks all chipper and happy. But the reality is we had the worst time trying to get on a plane. So the rules for you have to take, so you have to pass a COVID test, a negative test, to get into Ecuador, but then you also have to take a negative test to get out of Ecuador. So the whole way we were praying and hoping, you know, that we'd get in and then hoping we'd get out. And so, but we found out sort of right at the last minute that uh, Ecuador had changed its rules and the, and the type of test we had taken was going to be obsolete one hour before we arrived. Oh my God. And so we were talking to the airline and everybody we could get a hold of. Jeff even talked to the U.S. consulate, and they couldn't give us a straight answer. Like nobody could give us a straight answer. And so what they finally determined, I mean, so we came this close to spending an extra thousand dollars almost on getting like this rapid test done, and we just finally were like, you know, what the what the airlines finally said. Someone finally convinced me that that they're gonna it's gonna be based on when you get on the plane, not when you get off it. And so until we got off the plane and made entry into Quito, we were sort of holding our breath the whole time. So anyway, that was a lot of fun. Uh, next picture. And so there's the test. They caused all the problems. Okay, so you can see it's negative. Praise God. Okay, and then the other thing that happened was they accosted us. Uh, they wouldn't let us through security until they took our peanut butter. So we were taking, Nate, the one thing Nate asked for was peanut butter. Anyway, we did sneak some other peanut butter in elsewhere, but they got our peanut butter and sriracha, sriracha sauce, however you say that, and uh, some bag of, uh, actually that one almost got me in trouble. It was a bag of, uh, I think it was like sugar and maybe hot cocoa, I don't know, but it was, they were like, what, what is this powder? Right, it was in a little Ziploc bag, and they said, whose bag is this? I, you know, I couldn't say, I didn't go through this bag, because Somebody gave this to me, but anyway, so, yeah, they, they let us through. okay. We were real sorry about that. And then we sat on the, like, it took so long just to get to Houston. So there's, you can see Marlon's really feeling it over there on the right. So once we, we got delayed and delayed and delayed, and we finally got on the plane and sat on the tarmac for, like, two hours. 
Yeah. And then we flew, and once we got to Houston, we flew around a bit because there were storms and they shut down the airport. We were like the last plane in, and all the bays were full, so we sat on that tarmac for a long time. So we felt like we'd gone to Antarctica by the time we got to Houston. I mean, typically Houston's not that hard. So anyway, uh, so the start was kind of slow, but go ahead. And here we go. So finally approaching Ecuador. And I just took this. This is a on my map on my phone. I just put in the church and put in where we were when we landed. And so just kind of a glimpse of where we were in context of where we are today. And uh, so in Quito, leaving the Quito airport. And it did a lot of driving. So once we finally got there, we arrived. I guess we, uh, we arrived about 1 in the morning. No, it was more like 2, 3. Yeah, see, I can't even. I think it was about 3, 34 by the time we actually got to Quito. And then the, the drive from the airport is like four hours. So, so a lot of this, and it was amazing. I mean, the Andes are unbelievable. So just a glimpse of the countryside and of the drive. You know, what's fascinating about it is, um, I mean, their mountains are taller than ours. I mean, you've got 19,000, 20,000 peaks, volcanoes, and all of this. But you see, th that's farmland, like going almost straight up the mountainside. And it's just lush. And um, Anyway. Go ahead. So huge waterfalls we got to see. Go ahead and keep going. These are hard to see. The light's not good. Uh, lots of bridges over massive ravines. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, so like on a lot of these, uh, there'd be some big swing or zip line that you could do. And this one is blessed by Jesus. You know, we thought, oh, you know, there's a painting of Jesus. We thought, that's really comforting. You know, if we did that one, we at least know the Lord will be with us. So go ahead. Okay, yeah, so this is a, a huge waterfall that Nate took us to. Uh, it's a waterfall at uh, Ban Banos, I believe. And uh, these stairs, real steep, go down to it. Go to the next one. I don't think it'll play, but it's a video of it. If you can hear it, better you see it. So just our group, uh, you can see Ethan's real wet over here. So we did a lot of this, and this was a lot of fun, of course. Go ahead. And uh, this is a picture, actually, of the river valley, which kind of come out into, uh, how do you say it again, Pastaza? Pastaza is the county, county, or the, what do you, I'm referring to Jim because Jim's been there. It's like a state. It's a problem. Yeah, yeah, the province. Yeah, that's the word I'm looking for. Yeah, so the river, it kind of plans, it plans out here. And so uh, where we end up is in Shell, Ecuador. And, uh, and this is really kind of the foothills of the Andes and right on the borderline of the Amazon basin and kind of the headwaters of the Amazon. And so uh, go ahead. Yeah, so you see here uh, Shell. You see the Andes on the right run right down the middle of the country, and the shell is just to the right. Near, if you can read it, it's the city of Puyo on the map here in the center right. And then as you can see, everything off to the right more or less is just all jungle, and it just heads off into uh, the Amazon Basin, which is goes all the way to the, all the, way to the Atlantic. And um, so go ahead. And this is, we didn't fly in, but this is just a glimpse of the city of Shell. So uh, it's a picture of the airstrip. And the property that we were on and visiting is just right next to the airstrip. Shell itself is, uh, I think it's about 8,000 people. And back in the whenever 30s or 40s, it was founded by Shell Oil. Actually, they built the airstrip so they could explore for oil. And then now the town has sort of grown up around it. So go ahead. And just this is the town center uh, Shell. In fact, you can see the airplane here in the back. Go into the next slide. Yeah, so this is a like a representation of, I don't know if you know the story or not, but the five Ecuador martyrs that were killed in like 1956 were speared to death by this tribe. And, um, and so the, the plane that they flew in on looked like this. It was flown by Nate Saint, 
and uh, he was the missionary pilot. And so the city, just the entire city center of Shell is dedicated to Nate Saint and MAF, uh, Mission Aviation Fellowship. And uh, anyway, this is just, it was sort of a neat uh, centerpiece to the town. So go ahead. And, and on the property, even there's a the school facility that's been there. Uh, it's called the Nate Saint Memorial School. And so just kind of even the history of it is really fascinating being there. In fact, the property was donated or given or sold. I think it was donated by Nate Saint uh, for a hospital and a school. And uh, you know what's fascinating about it and even being there, if you know the story at all, it's, it's interesting thinking about, for me, watching and thinking that the way that Nate Saint and even all the other guys and families that were part, the way they invested their lives and some of them lost their lives, um, they didn't get to see everything that happened in the future. But being there, being on the property and seeing this, these tribal guys, the Wadarani Indians, and their families and their children running around, I thought those guys would all feel like it was really worth it, the sacrifice that they made. So anyway, go ahead. Um, and this is the, it's like a museum of the Nate Saint family house. And go ahead. On the nearby property. Here's, uh, so this is not Nate Saint, this is Nate Duff. And he's about to spear Chet over here, it looks like. So we got Ethan and Nate and Chet Williams, Chet and Katie Williams are, so this is, if you don't know, this is Nate Dell, Nate and Rochelle Dell. They hail from Kremlin, and, uh, but they currently live in Shell on this property. It's owned by the organization called CENTA. It's in Spanish, but it stands for Center for Tribal Empowerment or Equipping or something like that. And, um, and so anyway, they exist to serve the tribal community. And so Chad and Katie Williams, uh, they went down there too, and he, I think, kind of oversees this, uh, this property or the museum. So go ahead. And uh, this is just the radio room. They preserved the house as it was, you know, uh, 70 years ago, more or less, at least in this part. And so they were kind of giving us the tour of that. So go ahead. Okay, so this is on the property. Uh, it's, I believe it's about a 10-acre property. And you can see Ethan's walking along with a machete there because it's real dangerous there on the property. You know, there's lots of people like Marlon running around <laughs> um, and Nate Dell. But anyway, that's the guest house right there in the center. And so that's where we stay. The house over on the left is Nate and Rochelle's home, is their home. And so that's where they live, right over there. That's their house. And um, so go ahead. And this is Chet and Katie's house and just sort of a glimpse of the property. Go ahead. And so our first day there, we were, you know, I think we got there 8 in the morning, slept for an hour or two, and then got up, and they took us on a little jungle hike. And so this is, uh, you know, when we just got back after bushwhacking. But go ahead, and I'll show you a few of these pictures. Uh, there's a bridge on the property, kind of one of the big bridges that crosses the ravine. And uh, go ahead. And so just another glimpse of that. Go ahead. And so me and Ethan and Chet and the dog. And so, and uh, I'm sorry, I, some of the pictures, I didn't get everybody's pictures, so I'm in some of them more. Than, it's not just because I like to see myself. It's just the pictures I had. So go ahead. So there's Marlon walking down the river. We were kind of bushwhacking through here. And go ahead. So real jungly. They said this wasn't actually the jungle yet, but sort of the outskirts of it. But and you can see even the flowers here. You know, as Marlon's sort of climbing up over that bank, it's uh, just the flowers everywhere. It's just lush and beautiful. Just more of that. Orchids growing on trees everywhere. Go ahead. I had my clicker. Yeah, just flowers. Just oh, so right here, that's actually literally an orchid growing on the roof. Of this. So I thought that was cool. Lots of bugs, walking stick, caterpillars. They said just don't touch them. Okay, so uh, so this we didn't actually see bugs this big, thankfully. But uh, but this this is a collection that came from a lady named Miriam, who's a nurse a missionary nurse who's been down there for 40 or more years. And this was her bug collection. Go ahead and um, you can see. So that's like, a, I don't know, like a rhino beetle, a giant, you know. And uh, next one. And so just moths and 
whip scorpions and all sorts of stuff. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I wanted to pause here real quick. Kind of the first thing I wanted to say about this is, um, so the lady that, that when, one night they, they had her over, she's a missionary nurse. Her name is Miriam, and she's been down there for like over 40 years. Went down there. In fact, she said she first went down there and said, I'm going to go down there for two years. And then uh, she ended up staying, you know, her whole life. And so I guess she's sort of on the verge of retirement. She just got some health issues and may have to come back to the States. But anyway, so she was the one that was showing us all of her bug collection and all of that. And just told us a lot of stories, especially because as a nurse, you know, she worked at the hospital, which served this tribal community, as well as like a number of other tribal communities. And then also just the people that came in from town, the other Ecuadorians and Kichwas and all the various other tribes and people. And, but, but also as far as the Wadarani Indians, she had spent a lot of time going in and out of the jungle, like for years and years and years doing you know, medical work. And, and of course she did lots of labor and delivery and, and all of this. So she had a lot of stories. And, uh, and so it was fascinating to kind of hear her share all of that. But one of the things that she talked about, and I, one of the reasons I put a picture of this up here is, um, you know, we tried to get like boxes and boxes of this. We were wanting to give these away to all of you. Uh, but the, they make, uh, they, they raise their own dark chocolate, like coca you know, out there. And so some of the ladies, uh, the Wadrani, the tribal ladies, they grow their own coca and, and then sell it and it gets turned into chocolate and sold. And at the time, even Nestle, I think they said had, had made it, manufactured it. Anyway, at this point, so there wasn't a whole lot, so we just got a few, but, um, but this is kind of the packaging on their, cho their organic chocolate that comes right out of the rainforest. But, but what, so on the one hand, it's uh, an interesting project that they do. It helps some of the ladies who kind of farm it. But what Miriam was talking about, especially is if you turn on the back, on the inside fold about the, there's details about the Laterani tribe, and go ahead and give you the next slide. So these are a couple of ladies Miriam was talking about knowing personally. And, um, and she said, you know, for her, this picture really represents sort of the, the current situation with the tribal people uh, as they are right now. Because what she was saying is, the lady on the right, this is just, I'm just telling the way she told us, um, the lady on the right was a believer, so maybe even one of the early believers. I'm not sure that she'd been a believer for, uh, for a long time, and she died recently, and uh, but sort of lived her life, you know, for the Lord, walking with the Lord. And then the lady on the left, apparently, had, uh, she had moved out and lived outside of the jungle and had had a lot of problems, and apparently she took her, ended up taking her own life. And what they were saying is that the, the idea of suicide, and so there was a lot of violence in the culture, before uh, the introduction of Christianity, but there was like suicide was just not a thing. And so kind of their, the modern world and their interaction with the modern world uh, coming out of the jungle and sort of the culture, uh, realities of culture change that they're faced with is a real disorienting reality for, for the current, you know, people that are trying to live with that reality. And so she was just saying, you know, she thought this picture really kind of painted the, a portrait in just one picture of kind of the cross-section of the people. You've got those, especially some of the older people in the tribe who are, who've been believers for a long time, and then the newer, the younger people who are wrestling with the modern world and wrestling with their faith. And, um, and so anyway, I just thought that was a fascinating story. And, and so she was even giving these out and encouraging us. I've only got two, but if you would like one, I'd like to give it to you. She was encouraging us to kind of hand these out and say, you know, if you think about that story and ladies like this as it represents the people, to be praying for the Wadarani people, uh, the ladies, but also the, all the men and the children, everybody, and just to realize they're people just like we are, and they deal with, like, we find the modern world bewildering, right? I mean, how many of you guys find it hard to figure out technology and how to deal with the just the overwhelming kind of power of our culture as it exists and if for them, you know, we've been dealing with it for a long time in the Western world, but like for people like this, it, it's all fairly new and alluring, and it's all, but it has the same challenges that we face, you know. And so, um, 
So if you think about it, you know, these are real living people, and I think the idea to be praying for them as you do. So, Okay, so back to the insects. Uh, and in fact, this gets into food because this is, uh, this is a plate of fried ants that we got to eat, and uh, they, were, they were okay, did they? Okay, good. <laughs> All right, and this is pretty big, actually. So, so what they were saying, so this is Omadi, and uh, she was the one who was like, oh, you guys have to have ants. And, um, but so the deal with these ants, what the story is, uh, correct me if I get it wrong, I refer to Jim, again, because Jim's been down there, many of you guys know. Um, so they, what they say is these will hatch, and they go out everywhere, and when they hatch, like, everything shuts down. School, work. Because everyone goes and collects them in sacks and bags, and it's like a big deal. So anyway, uh, we got them cooked and mildly salted, which I think is maybe not the way it always so. <laughs> Go ahead, next one. Okay, some more food. You can see, you know, here we have a huge thing of bananas. And bananas everywhere for every meal and every snack. <laughs> and uh, so go ahead. Even the dogs like bananas. <laughs> You know, I've tried to feed a dog a banana, and it, my dog never wanted, but these dogs beg for bananas. So, go ahead. Okay, and then uh, some more food. You know, we would, the way we would set up at lunchtime was these big, long tables that when we were working on. Okay, so I talked about this. I touched on this last Sunday. Um, one of the main reasons we went down there is because their church building where they – they meet, their, they call it a Bible study. It's sort of a cross between a church and a Bible study. They meet for worship and they're reading the Bible in their own language. Because so many of them have actually been uh, either not really a part of a church because they feel out of place or they're in Spanish speaking, churches only, which is not their heart language. And, and so anyway, now they're, they're gathering on the property and they're gathering under this pavilion. And, um, and they're doing so to really kind of yeah, I mean, it's like young and old. You know, there's maybe 40, 50 people when we were there, and I think that's a pretty common amount. So this size, you know, maybe even just a little bit more. And in reading their Bible in their own language, because they're not historically a literary culture. Like, there's not great books or great works in the Wadrani language. Really, the, it was an oral culture, and they translated the Bible into that, the New Testament into that language. And so there's grammar, and, I, you know, they can read it, but there's just not a lot else in their language. And so it's a real spot for them over the last year as they've begun to meet on the property. And in this building, they call it the Chosa, is the word for the pavilion they meet in. Um, it, it's just a lot going on there. Like they're gathering and worship and they're reading the Bible together. But it's also in their own language. And it's sort of the older people are trying to pass that on to the younger, to the kids and to their kids and grandkids. And so it's just a sort of a neat... Uh, just a neat reality of what's going on, sort of a unique thing. And so it rains a lot, and there's a lot of holes in that roof. And so they're, they were saying there's been times they'll literally be in church with underneath the awning with umbrellas because it's leaking and raining on them. So our, one of our biggest goals was we were trying to get a new roof put on, uh, on that pavilion. So, so anyway, each day when we were out there working on it, we would take a break for lunch and and have, you know, this meal set up. And so go ahead to the next one. You never really know what you were going to get. I've heard this was possible, but um, this is a chicken foot at the bottom of my soup. And, you know, I'll be honest with you. Typically, I'm pretty adventurous. Like, I want to eat the stuff that everybody's eating. But I've been kind of having trouble, you know, for a couple of days. And so I just didn't eat the chicken foot. But one of the older guys saw that I wasn't eating it, and so he ate, ate it for me. And so, and use my spoon to eat it for, for me. And so, uh, yeah, so there's a couple of chicken feet and a chicken ankle. and Oh, yeah, so uh, grub worms here. Um, this is a big plate of grub worms. We didn't eat a lot of these, but we did sample them. Let's go ahead to the next. This is a video that probably won't show well. Let's see. Oh, yeah, look at that tasty. Bigger those. Yeah, bigger than my thumb, for oh. sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's good. You know, they take it out and they, they actually grilled it for us, put it on a little spit, and grilled it, put a little salt on it. It's all right. So here we are. They're, they're eating. 
to Marlon's really going to town. <laughs> Go, Marlon. All right. And then we applied positive peer pressure to Ethan. He wasn't quite sure. But <laughs> and he did it, and he pulled through. <laughs> and then we also ate fairly normal food as well. And uh, there's Jeff and Dan. And uh, go ahead. Yeah, so this is kind of the whole group. Uh, you got our guys who went down there, and then we got Nate and Chet in the back. And then also here in front is Freddie. And Freddie is like the foreman. He, he works for Senta. He works for them. And he's really the guy who kind of makes it all happen. He's the guy that organizes and plans it and doesn't stop. And this, he and his wife, Lady. And um, anyway, so what's interesting, so Freddie is actually Kichua. He's like a Highland Kichua, Kichua. Which what's fascinating historically about that is that they're the descendants of the Incas. And um, so anyway, but Freddie's a believer and uh, just a really great guy. And he knows, you know, he speaks Spanish, I think a little Guadarrami and a little English. And so we got to kind of get to know him and work with him so. Okay, so we did a lot of this, like here's a picture of Jeff and Ethan and Marlon, and then uh, this is Felipe here on the left and his wife. I can't remember her name, but just looking at photographs and pictures. In fact, that you know, Jeff is a game warden, and so he had all kinds of pictures of you know, elk and moose and deer and every sort of thing. And so uh, he was showing them pictures of, of all of these, and of course, you know, they're, they're like, oh, those are huge animals. How do you eat that in one day? No, it's not quite like that. But, um, anyway, so we had a lot of fun with that. Showed them a lot of pictures of you guys and of our church and our families, and so they just were fascinated by that. Here's a couple of little girls, one of the families that was there. There's, uh, and just some of the girls here, they're sanding and planing the boards, and see Nate and Jeff in the background. These are just, a lot of these pictures I threw, I just show pictures of the people, because of course we're there primarily just to interact with the people. And, and so, yeah, here's a picture of uh, it's me and Maniwa and uh, Kai, which they call Grandpa. And and so he was he was the guy that ate my chicken feet. And um, <laughs> anyway, so, but these guys, so he's an older guy, and I, I honestly don't know how old he is, um, but he was there every day. You know, they would show up every day, ready to work, all of them. And, um, and Maniwa is, I think he's like early 30s, and, and Maniwa is one of the guys who's, he's not the pastor of, the, of their church down there. They're sort of avoiding some of that language right now. It's primarily like a big Bible study. Um, but he's really one of the, he's kind of the shepherd of the group, and he kind of leads the Bible studies on Sunday mornings. And um, so anyway, I uh, got to know him. He's actually been to the States. And he's been here, I believe. Uh, right, Maniwa? Been here? And uh, so he speaks English, uh, not you know extremely well, but enough that we could communicate. And uh, so he's a great guy. Um, go ahead. It's more, you got Carlos and his wife. Those two little girls are part of the ones that I showed a picture of earlier. And then here on the right is some of the younger guys that Ethan especially got to know. you got Willie and Bryce. And, uh, and, and those guys, I think, are like 18 and 15. And, um, and Bryce, similar, he speaks pretty good English. He's good friends with one of the missionaries' kids. And uh, and then the guys on the right, again, is uh, Manilo, is all the way on the right. And then just left of him is Nepo. And, and Nepo and Manilo are sort of the guys who really are helping shepherd the Sunday morning gatherings. And, and Nepo, in particular, really works with the children. He's really got a heart for the kids, and he gathers them. And in a minute, you'll probably see a picture of him with, the, with all the kids. And uh, so anyway, just great guys, and, uh, and a lot of fun getting to know them. So okay, like this is um, we were we were at the guest house, and they have this giant book of the birds of Ecuador. And so here, Grandpa's showing me uh, all the birds. You know, they just sort of they I mean they know it's like they know the jungle. Like they may not know kind of modern society so well, but but they know like birds and critters of the jungle like crazy. And so they had a lot of fun making their calls and, and telling us all about the birds and the animals. Go ahead. And go ahead, you can go again. Next one. Okay, 
so like a lot of what we did was just work with them. Like this is in the wood shop, and here uh, Jeff and Armani are, are drilling holes with a drill press. And uh, go ahead. And then this is at the table during lunch. You got Nate on the right, and you know some of these other guys and gals. And then just the other end of the table. Go ahead. And so just all the people that we got to know and work with, you know, that a lot of them were there every day. A handful of them came and went. Um, go ahead. Of course, there's Nate trying on a hat for us. Okay, so uh, what am I doing on time? So this is looking from Nate and Rochelle's house at the wood shop where you saw the drill press and all that. It's on the far right. And then here on the left is more of like where they keep all the tools and everything. But then also on this far left wall is on the inside is, is all of their electrical supply for the whole property. And anyway, one of the projects we did was that they're trying to invert it. And, and so go to the next slide. Um, we built on the outside so that they can close it here on the outside and have more storage. And so we just expanded this building work on that. So we did a lot of concrete, and so go to the next one. Um, just working on it. Here are different pictures of some of the work that was done. Go ahead. And then you see all the wheelbarrows of concrete. We were doing it all, bringing it up, and they'd hoist it up on a bucket. But then, of course, it started raining. Go ahead. And press play, you can at least see it. See here all our... Uh, Wheelbarrows of concrete are underneath the driveway. Trying to keep it through that. Okay. So that was uh, that was the main, you know, that was one of the first projects we did. And then this is inside the Chosa on our first full morning there, I guess it was. Uh, was that on? That was a Saturday morning, I guess. Anyway, uh, before any work started, we would gather with the guys and the gals who'd come to work and have a devotional time. And sometimes it'd be shorter and sometimes it'd be a lot longer. If it was raining, it, we'd sort of go on and do it for a long time. But this is uh, just a picture when we first met under the pavilion. And then go ahead. And then we started meeting in the guest house. There were so many people coming uh, that we would just gather every day like this and go to the next one. And what was really fun about this is someone would read maybe a passage in English or, or somebody would read it in Wairani or Watadeo, which is their language, or uh, they'd read it in Spanish. But nonetheless, we would just all read in our different translations of the Bible together. And there was this trilingual uh, attempt to communicate and read the Bible together. And it was just a lot of fun. And... Um, so here's a picture of Nate and Rochelle with Grandpa, and uh, and I they're I think reading some verse, and so she's kind of showing it to him on her phone. And uh, go ahead. So here's a picture of the Wadrani Bible, and uh, as you can see, it's the Wadrani New Testament. As you can see, it has its own rain jacket. They all have little rain jackets because it's so wet down there. <laughs> anyway, um, so. I just I wanted to show you this slide. One, just the Bible that they do have, and, and it's actually really large because to say so, I would read. You know, I, I read like a verse. It was like three or four verses long, and they were like, I think we're gonna have to read it shorter because to say it in their language is like a lot longer, and so we kind of had to take that into account. But anyway, so they've had the New Testament now for a long time. Uh, maybe what has it been about forty years? The New Testament, do you know? Not that long, 30 years? Or, I guess it was late 90s, is that right? Late 90s, yeah. Okay, yeah, late 90s. So whatever that is, a little over 20 years. So they got the New Testament in their language. And um, and so so on the one hand, part of what's going on is they're really, it's kind of a new push among, among them to read God's Word in their own language and read it in their heart language. And and so it's, it's a combination of their own walk with the Lord and their own understanding of God's word for themselves and their own heart language. But also for someone, especially the older ones, are saying, like, because among some of the younger guys that, that are really interacting with the outside world, some of them aren't sure they totally want to be identified 
as Guarani, and so like they're, they want to just speak Spanish and kind of integrate into the culture, and so there's some cultural shame going on, and so part of what's happening is we're saying, no, this is our language and our people and our culture, and we can read God's word in our language, and so some of what's going on is they're, they're doing that, and so it's just a neat, it's a neat deal and a neat time that's going on, but um, like a lot of uh, other tribal peoples that are small little tribal groups, the Vibrani only have the New Testament. They don't have the Old Testament in their language. The way I say it is they don't have it yet. Because this is a prayer of mine, and I would invite you to pray that we would, you know, one day maybe see an Old Testament in the Vibrani language as well. And uh, and so so that they can have access to all of God's Word. And um, anyway, so that's just one of their Bibles. And the other deal, actually, about this is that there is, I believe, what they said is they now only have 40 more of these printings. Was it 40? Is that what they said? 40 Bibles left. Yeah, 40 Bibles left that aren't already kind of dispersed. And so we were talking about, you know, is there a way that if you need more, you know, can we help? Can we have more printed? And so there's a way they can have more printed. And we talked about, you know, that maybe that's something we could even financially, you know, help pay for. And so anyway, uh, just keep that in your prayers, if you would. As they have need. So so this, anyway, uh, so along with gathering with the people and worshiping God together, this was Sunday morning uh, before we did any work on the roof. And so we gathered just in the Chosa together. And uh, this is Maniwa here standing uh, and leading the group. And so go ahead to the next slide. Here he is, again, speaking, picture from the side. Okay, yeah, so this is Sunday school class. So we got Vico over here on the left, and Ethan was helping him out on the right. And all the kids here that are working on some Bible story, they're coloring. And uh, so he, they took them off and, and did a Sunday school time and then played soccer and whatever else they did. Oh, oh the other day, so you see him, uh, so I brought one of these crowns. So, they, so whenever they gather, another thing about, because this is like as they gather, so they're gathering... They're gathering right now. You know, I mean, they're on central time, so this is, they're just about to wrap up probably. But so as they gather, one of the things that's required is, because you know, traditionally clothes are optional. And so the way that they did it is they were traditional. You know, they had their certain traditional things they wore. But, um, I mean, it's optional by our standards. But um, they would wear some sort of, decoration or jewelry or whatever they like a necklace or a crown or whatever it is and it's all a part of kind of this is a wild Rani gathering this is our people worshiping God in our language and um, anyway so uh, we all wore like some sort of necklace or crown or whatever so you see him here on the left where you're not go ahead uh, and this is a picture of from the outside is that a video yeah I think I showed this last week, but it may not show well, but you can hear it. Okay, so what I want to do next is I have two recordings, and I want to let you go to church with the Wadaronis. This is uh, two of their songs that they sing, and that I recorded two of these, so if it'll play. Is it loud enough? Can you guys all hear?
in the next one. And remember, as we're gathering, the way they gather is just lining the walls. And so everyone's facing each other and addressing one another. So just the, the one instrument that God gave all of us, which is our voice. And um, so, you know, I always say we should make a joyful noise. Well, there you go. And if that sounds strange to you, just imagine how strange we sound to them. Right? Okay, so like after church, we just hung out with all the kids and played soccer on the lawn and frisbee and go to the next one. You can uh, skip that. It's just a video. Okay, so working on the Chosa, the pavilion, uh, this is how it looked in the beginning. And they had sort of just reclaimed it. It had been storage up until about a year or so ago. And uh, so this is how it looked when we first got there. And then I just have a handful of slides, if I remember right, of, of kind of its transformation. And I wanted to show you that. So. Uh-oh. Doing a spinning. Oh, that's not good. Well, uh, we'll maybe give it a minute, and if we have to restart it, we can. Uh, we are We're close to the end. We're on 95. If you want to redo it, I'll talk about something real quick. Um, if it'll let you get out of it. So <clears throat> I've talked about this book before, and I want to encourage you, if you're interested in the story of this tribe and this group and just what's going on down there in Shell, Ecuador, and in the jungle, is uh, this is a great book about the history up to the current called God in the Rainforest. And, uh, and I would encourage you, it's a tale of martyrdom and redemption in Amazonian Ecuador. And so I would encourage you, if you're not familiar with the story and you want a good read, you can check that out. And um, let's do this while they try to get it rebooted. Um, any of you guys have any questions that I can answer about our trip or our time down there? Anything you want to know? Anything you've seen or haven't seen yet? Yes, sir. Oh, 
Yeah, what, yeah, what's sure. What's kind of the community and area like in terms of the different people and sort of who you're... In relation to the people, primarily? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, sure. No, it's a great question. Um, and sorry if I haven't been clear on, on this. Uh, so Ecuador is made up predominantly by, if I understand right, uh, the Ecuadorian people. It's like a mestizo people and culture. Because, um, you know, the Spanish conquered the Incas maybe in the 1500s. And, um, and so it's sort of the blend and mix of the European mix and whoever the predominant culture group was. And, and so the Ecuadorians, that's sort of your general Ecuadorian who are all over the country. And correct me if I'm wrong, Jim, but uh, there's a lot of the Quechua, which is there's Highland Quechua and Lowland, Lowland Quechua, which are the descendants of the Incas. And, and they are, if I understand right, they're the largest people group uh, that's the largest minority group is the Kichu of, of different sorts. And then you've got the various tribal groups of whom the Guadarani Indians are. There's the other groups called the uh, Shuar and the Ashwar and maybe others. And so they all sort of uh, frequent, you know, the towns like that, either they live there. It's like Freddie and his wife, the guy who's the foreman. Um, he's from elsewhere, like up closer to the mountains. But they just, for whatever reason, they moved to Shell and lived there. I think maybe his uh, maybe his family moved there when he was young. And so there, you know, it's like anywhere, you know, people move around and, and live just like like we do. Um, but with the tribal group, the Vatarani in particular. So I, on that early picture and map where it showed their ancestral tribal lands, um, that predominantly is theirs. Like they occupy a huge swath of land. Uh, out in the Amazonian region, and they predominantly live out there. Like the vast majority of them live, and they, they, they're still even very nomadic. And they'll, they'll, they'll have clearings or villages where they'll clear trees and they'll live there and they'll garden or they'll hunt until the gardening and the hunting is, you know, kind of playing out, and then they'll move on to the next village. And so, like, even a lot of these guys in the pictures that I'm showing, um, a lot of them are from all sorts of different villages throughout. Uh, the region, the Vatarani region in the in the Amazon jungle, off to the east of where we were, and so for them, a lot of them will travel to Shell and other places. But Shell seems to be uh, one of the main sort of jumping off and points, both into the jungle and out of the jungle. And so when they, so for a lot of the ones, even that, so there are a handful that I met who would actually say they lived in Shell or they lived in Puyo, but what most of them would say is they stay in Shell because they're not living there. They're only temporarily staying there for some reason. Like some of the little girls were going to school in Shell, but then they also go to school out. They've got some school schooling out in the jungle. And so for whatever reason, whether they need to see a doctor or I don't know what all, uh, maybe work or family or travel, uh, they'll come out. And they'll be out for some amount of time, but then they all tend to, a lot of them end up going back into the jungle, into the various villages and clearings out in the jungle. And so, so that region in the jungle is, is supposed to be only Guadarrama. It's like a, it's a protectorate. And so the, the government of Ecuador actually supposedly enforces that. And so people do encroach on it and they squat into the jungles. But it's, it's like, it's not like a reservation in the sense of the way we think of it, but it's, it's tribal lands, like it's their tribal lands. Am I saying this all yeah. more or less right? And, um, and so for them, it really is kind of their place. And, and so when they come out of the jungle, they, Shell is one of the main places they do that and uh, for various reasons. And so does that kind of answer your yeah. question? So, but because of what we were doing and because of where we were staying on the on that 10 acre compound, um, we almost only interacted with the Wadarani Indians. We, we interacted with some of the Ecuadorians and others, uh, but it was more incidental. We were just because they come not only to Shell, but also to the property there at Senta. And, and some of that, and I mentioned this uh, last Sunday, 
is in some regard where they stay, where they tend to stay or live in the community is sort of like on the wrong side of the tracks. I mean, you know, they're in little huts and shacks, which for them is real normal, kind of out in the jungle. It's real viable and normal and they have everything they need. But when they come out of the jungle into sort of the cities, you know, they're, they're economically kind of at the bottom of the barrel and socially kind of viewed that way. So they live on the outskirts and they stay on the outskirts predominantly. And, um, and so I think for me, what I kind of saw was Senta and the, the, the 10 acres that they have there that they're maintaining and hosting them on, that it's really a safe place for them because the reality is even some of the girls have been attacked out in the out in the outskirts of the village because some of them even, we met one or two, they said this girl lives alone. She's like 14 years old. And like in some, in, in some of the individual girls uh, would live that way. And so even right before we got there, Rochelle and some of the ladies hosted a self-defense class there on the property. And we're just teaching them things like how to protect yourself and also like don't live alone. You know, if you got a handful of young girls, like live together, things like that. And so, but but almost everybody we interacted with substantively was just the Wild Mountain tribe. And so, but but there's a lot of other types of people, as well as foreigners, like uh, Westerners of different sort, Euro- Europeans, Americans that live down there for travel. And so, are we back up and running, you think? Yep. Did that answer your question? Okay. Charlene, you had a... Angie, you had You sure? Okay. All right. Let's try it again. And I'll try to get through these. We're, we're close. So, okay, this is the finished product. So if you want to go back and forth, it's just kind of a side-by-side. So that's how it looked before, and then we got the new roof on it. This is the way it looks today. And uh, go ahead to the next slide. So here they're taking the roof off. While we were pouring concrete, they were taking the, the original roofing off. And so go ahead. And took it down all the way to the beams, pretty much all around. And this is just a picture we that the guys were manufacturing all of the and having to fabricate all of the braces and everything that went up. So the drill press and everything that they were doing was to was to really secure the, the roof on this. So that's a picture of all the all the little uh, braces for that. And a picture of it going up. You keep going through. See Ethan hanging onto the rafter. And so Marlon and Dan, they were fixing some of the benches were weak, and so they were fixing those. Oh, go back. Uh, yeah, it's just two pictures. Go ahead. putting the beams on. Okay, so this was the day that we left. We did not get finished putting the whole roof on. We got the rafters and everything up and some of the beams. And so we gathered to pray together to dedicate this pavilion to the worship of God, to the Ladrani tribe, and for just their gathering together in this place. And so we, so Mani was on my left and I'm there. And uh, I think that's Dan. I'm not sure who that is on the right. And, um, so we were just praying together that God would bless and protect and use the, the property here. And some more pictures of the roof going up. And so these are some pictures that they have sent me since then, just of the completed project. And so on the inside, go ahead. Yeah, looking good. Okay. And then here on the left, what's really cool is Nate said they just finished the day they just finished the roof and this rainbow appeared right behind it and right there on the left. So he, he said that, that was a promise. So really cool. Okay, so we brought home a bunch of spears and blow gum. Like Jeff bought a blow gun and <laughs> the game warden, you know. And um, anyway, uh, and, and so in fact, I've got one. Um, maybe when we're done, I'll bring it in. And... Um, so we stuck it in this huge PVC pipe, and it like barely passed the airline. Like literally, if it had been maybe a centimeter longer, 
it wouldn't have got on the plane. But it almost didn't get on the plane, and they almost didn't get on the plane. So go ahead to the next slide. You see how tall that thing is. Um, so they checked it. Yeah, no problem. And uh, anyway, in fact, what happened was they, they charged us kind of their oversized freight on it. And then we had so much trouble, they gave us all the money back, which is cool. So, so here's when we landed back in Denver, trying to get it all in the car. Go ahead. And <laughs> driving home. <laughs> yeah, so uh, and then here's a picture of Nate and Rochelle. This is at a, uh, they have, I guess, like an annual Bible conference out in the jungle. And uh, this was a part of that gathering several years ago. And um, is that the last slide? That may be the end. Yep, that's the end. Yeah, so anyway, I just, like I said, I feel like I left a lot out. And if you got questions, feel free to ask. I uh, just wanted to give you a sample of kind of what we did and who the people are and, and just what it's like down there. Just in a way, just trying to, when I put this together, I thought just to, I couldn't take you all with, with us. I mean, we'd love, I know some of you even came this close to going with us, but maybe, Lord willing, we'll go again, and there might be an opportunity to go again. But I just thought, I wanted to put this together in a way to sort of take you along with us so you can kind of see. And, and ultimately, you know, as I think about this, to me, it's not even just the novelty of it, because it's different, and it's fun, and it's, you know, neat being in a new place and seeing, meeting new people and all of that. But, but really the, the special thing to me about it all is the people and what God is so evidently doing down there. And uh, then also just being able to work with Nate and Rochelle and to see them in their element. And I did give them a kiss for you guys. Nate and so Nate's parents are here and Rochelle's dad is here. And um, anyway, and so uh, they, I, I gave them a hug, but I also gave them a kiss for you. So, and uh, Nate in particular, give Nate a kiss for you. And uh, anyway, and so just connecting with them down there, you know, you guys, if you've been around, you've heard from Nate and Rochelle. They've been here and shared in our church before. Uh, but it was just fun to connect with them and support them in what they're doing. And uh, so glad you guys are here. And they, these guys probably know a lot more about it than I do. So if you want to grab them afterwards, feel free to ask them questions. I think, Jim, you brought a handful of things maybe to, did you bring? And I'll go get one of the, I've got a spear in the car and I can show that. And uh, just to see, I carry it around. It's like my concealed carry spear. <laughs> anyway, uh, I didn't, it didn't fit, you know. So, anyway. Uh, did you have a question, Angie, Some that, that I didn't get to? No, I was just going to ask how long the flight actually took. Yeah, yeah. Like well, okay, so like I said, from here to Houston took forever. Uh, but that's like a two-hour, two-and-a-half-hour flight. And then Houston, and we had a layover. And then Houston to... Equip to Quito was like five hours. Oh. And we left at like one, I think like one in the morning. Well, no, 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 we talked about it. Yeah. We arrived, anyway, it doesn't matter. Yeah, it's like a five hour flight to Quito mm -hmm. and then a four hour drive to Shell, which is more like in the center, center of the country. And then the same thing coming back. So when we left, we left Shell. We got ready on Friday morning. We left at about 11 or 11.30, I guess. Drove to Quito, took our time, and sort of, you know, saw the sights on the way. And then we flew out of Quito at about 2.30 in the morning, got to Houston, and had a long layover in Houston. And then it's a quick flight to, to Denver. And we were we got back up here about 8, 8 o'clock, I think, Saturday night. That's when we showed up Sunday morning. We all looked a little bedraggled and, you know, all of that. So, anyway. Any other questions with that? Mark, I'd like to say something if I could. Sure. Um, you know, in the last 50 years or so that I've been working with the Wild Randy, uh, I've dealt with hundreds of people who have come down and then heard their stories afterward. I want to congratulate you on getting it right. You nailed it. Uh, so often people come back and they miss the whole point. Uh, so you get you did a good job. And I well, appreciate thanks. what you guys were doing down there. Uh, it's changed dramatically. Uh, you mentioned you asked me last night if I wanted to bring a couple items, and I'll, I've got several things here I wanted to bring. 
just to talk to you about very briefly. This is an axe head, stone axe. This is where the people were living when I was living down there. They, when we got there, they were using stone axes. Um, Christianity came. They had the highest rate of murder ever recorded in the history of man. And uh, then when the wild honey started becoming Christians, the crown is the symbol of peace. And they gave up the killing and started living in peace. Uh, it's changed dramatically in recent years. Now we've got these young kids moving out, and this has become the big thing. Alcohol has, has destroyed so much down there. And if I had asked you to pray for one thing, it said it would be get rid of the alcohol. But the other one, of course, is the attraction of the outside world. Uh, is just destroying the people. Mm. Uh, I got a call late last night from Rochelle saying, help me understand what's going on here because uh, a woman is trying to text me and it sounds bad and I don't know what exactly she's trying to say. Mm. It's very confusing. And uh, it was a single gal, single mom, living alone in a very bad area out on the outside world. And uh, somebody had broken in stole all their food and the utensils and uh, she has this little baby girl and very, very concerned. So Rochelle and me had to get up in the middle of the night, go over, take her food and things like that. And so we need to be praying that God will raise up leaders for himself, not the kind that the world will raise up. So thanks for your presentation. Yeah, thank you. Well, thanks for that. Yeah, it means a lot. Yeah. Well, it was a privilege to be down there. And honestly, you know, as you talk about that, that's one of the things I saw, and you guys probably know this, uh, with Nate and Rochelle, they carry a, a heavy burden. And, um, you know, people talk about pastoral ministry, like, the you know, the lights never go off, and you know, the phone's always on, and, and that's true. There's there's a way that's true. But, but the reality is... Uh, what they're dealing with is, you know, people show up at their house or call, you know, any time of day, and it can be crisis. Uh, it can be they don't have anybody else, they don't know anybody else, and so you know, Nate and Rochelle really carry a heavy load. And, uh, and my my understanding, is they didn't talk a lot about this, uh, but I think even since they've been back down there, Nate and Rochelle have been back down there for a little over a year, I guess. Um, they struggled with, you know, different sort of sicknesses, some sort of infection they've had, and. Uh, I mean, even, you know, like I didn't feel right half the time. And, um, and so then just sort of struggling with that. And so they, it's, it's, it's physical, it's spiritual, it's emotional that they carry. And I know they're happy to do it. They're glad to do it. You know, but it, it can, there's a lot of wear and tear. And so think about it. Be praying for Nate and Rochelle as well. As they, because I, I mean, the reality is I don't believe there's really anybody doing what they're doing with this group right now. There's just nobody there. In my sense was what's happening in their ministry and in their lives is really unique and special and important and um, like not only obviously you know we would say it's eternally significant and that's true but I mean in the moment like right now there's nothing else like it going on with the Wadarani tribe and and they serve they and I think my sense is that Nate Rochelle and even Chet and Katie they have a sense of that. And they are, you know, they're trying to handle that in a way that is really brings glory and honor to God, but also just as a real benefit to the people. And um, and so I know they're trying to navigate all of that. Um, Rochelle, you know, so Jim, how long did you guys live down there? Ten years? Or we so? lived there ten years, and yeah. uh, I go back every year for the yeah. last 50, 40 some years. Yeah. yeah, and just if you're curious, I, I volunteered briefly. Uh, they, they actually lived in the jungle. Like you lived predominantly in the jungle. In fact, Rochelle said something to me. I think she said before living on the property they were at, they'd only, she'd only been there like one time or something like that. So most of your experience has been like out in the, in the east, in the jungle. And um, so so anyway, just so, so Rochelle, I, I believe, as far as the, the, the 
missionaries down there is the one who's the most uh, able to communicate. So you're talking about her having trouble by text message. And so that's a real common thing. And so even for her, who's really fluent in the language, it's communications can still be difficult. It's a really difficult language. And um, so there's there's culture, there's language, there's uh, everything else that you know you deal with. And so I'd encourage you to pray for the Vadrona tribe, to also pray for Nate and Michelle, and also pray for their parents who are long ways away from them. And um, and just pray, you know, and I just want to pray personally how we as a church can t- continue to engage with them and support them and uh, just be a part of what God's doing, you know, if there's anything we can do. And so I just want to pray about that. So are there any, if there's not any other questions, uh, I want to move on, but I don't want to move on too quick. I'm sorry? Just a little over 2,000. Okay. When we first got there, it was 400. Wow. Wow. You said 2,000? Yeah. Yeah. And they're all still scattered off. In fact, there's one main segment of the tribe that's still totally isolated, right? Yeah. And hostile. Yeah. Yeah. About how big is that group? A couple hundred? No. No. No, it's not that big. It's under 100. Okay. And uh, they will kill anybody even relatives who come into that area. Yeah. And so they're like kind of in the far reaches before they're, you get into Peru, more, yeah. more or less. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that came up. You know, I know you know Nanto, I believe. He's been up here, right? Yeah. And um, he was talking about the village that he lives in now is near them and that they've even seen evidence of them nearby. And so, you know, I didn't follow everything that he was saying, but it sounds like you know, they're both concerned about contact with that group, but they also seem like, you know, maybe the Lord would bring them into contact. I don't know if that's the way you hear that, but that was kind of the way I thought he was saying it. And, and so that's another deal to pray about, too, is there's this part of their family, part of their tribe, who's still totally isolated and hostile and, and unreached in that regard. And, you know, uh, God knows their names and the hairs on their heads. and So, anyway. Um, what else? Anything else? Well, uh, like I said, when we're all done, feel free to ask me or Marlon or Ethan or any of the other guys that were on the trip or Jim or um, the Dells. You guys have been down there too, right? More than once, I believe, at least. And, uh, yeah, so, so these guys have been there. And if you've got any questions, feel free to uh, – I'm going to volunteer you briefly. Don't wear them out, you know, but feel free to talk to them as well. Anyway, so I'd like to go ahead and move on just for our service to wrap up. But, uh, anyway, let's let's take a minute and just pray for the Vaudrani tribe and then also for Nate and Rochelle, Chuck and Katie, the ministry of Centra. And um, they're, they're about all done. Oh, in fact, I don't think I mentioned this yet. Um, this morning, I rolled out of bed and I had a text that said, um, Maniwa and Nipo want a video with you at church this morning. And I was like, well, so we've talked about getting all the guys that went together and, and doing a video chat with them. And I said, well, I don't know if I can get everybody together. And they were like, well, this is a little different. So so we I called in and actually I put on my crown so I could attend. <laughs> and, uh, and I zoomed in, you know, and they just went around and showed, you know, they were gathering and singing, and they wanted to show us the roof. And they wanted to, they wanted me to tell you how much they appreciated sending us down there and praying for them. And uh, they were just happy and excited, and they wanted us to know they were praying for us. Mm-hmm. And um, so anyway, they're probably all done and, and uh, eating lunch and playing soccer now. But anyway, um, I wanted to share that as well. So... Um, I actually had a lot more I was going to say, but I'm going to save it because it's getting late. So let's do this. Um, let's pray together. And then what I want to do is, uh, let's just sing our last song and wrap up. And so, but before we do, let me, let me lead us in prayer. If you would please join me. Lord, we just thank you again this morning for the the privilege of this trip, being able to go down and and be a part of what you're doing. And uh, not only for me and the other guys that were on the the trip on this journey, but 
but for all of us, just even that our church would be able to be a part of not only what you're doing here in Hot Sulphur and Grant County, but indeed, even as we say, we, you know, we exist, our stated purpose is that we exist to make Jesus not ignorable in Grant County and to the ends of the earth. And we thank you, Lord, that even just a little out of the way church like ours can invest in people, in other people, in a way that matters, even outside of ourselves. And so, money, we just marvel at that, Lord. We, we celebrate that reality that you are able to do more than we ask, think, or imagine. And so we thank you for this trip, for the guys that went on it, for everyone who supported us. But really, more than any of that, Lord, we thank you for what you have done and what you are doing among the Warani people and in the people of Ecuador, even more broadly. But with them as this example of a little out of the way, hidden tribe that was hostile to everyone, even themselves, even not only killing outsiders, but killing themselves, and the way in which the gospel came in and brought transformation and brought an end to so much of that initial violence that had been so historic and, and brought an end to all their vendettas and, and brought forgiveness and brought mercy into this group that you have made this people that reflect your image. Even as we read earlier and prayed in the prayers of Revelation, just this truth and reality that there will be at the end of the age, before your throne, a huge crowd of people from every tribe, tongue, language, color, nation, speaking all of our various different languages, representing all of our various different cultures, and all together, under the lordship of Jesus Christ, able to understand one another, able to love and serve one another, able to have fellowship one with another, united in Jesus Christ. And I thank you, Lord, that at the end of the age, that is going to be fixed and permanent and real forever. There will never again be a shade of, of racial disharmony. There will never be again be a shade of, of disunity around language or culture or anything like that. Because it is all brought under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And I thank you for what you've begun amongst the Wadrani people. Even your word in Philippians chapter 1 says that I am confident of this. That what God began in you, he is going to complete. And Lord, I thank you that that's true for our lives individually. It's true of our church. It's true of what you're doing in the world around us. It's true for the Wadrani people. And Lord, I pray, indeed, as we unite our hearts this morning, and as we pray for the Wadarani Indians, as they're gathered this morning, as they disperse this morning, as they're living their lives in places like Shell, as they're staying temporarily, as they're living their lives out in the jungle, Lord, I pray that you would continue to plant the church of Jesus Christ among them. Indeed, like what Jim was saying, Lord, would you raise up leaders among them, to lead and shepherd your people, that you would strengthen and guard and protect them. Lord, I pray that the, through the ministry of Senta and even just the little pavilion that we worked on, where some of the people are able to come out and to gather and to, to worship together and to read your word together, I pray that like a wildfire, that will spread back into the jungles as they go back out into their villages and back out into their clearings and back out into their gardens, and back out into their hunting lands. And Lord, I pray that your word would take root and grow deep in their hearts. And we pray against the, the various uh, modern struggles that they're facing, whether it's suicide or alcohol, or, or just being confused and lost in the, in the culture that they're now encountering. Lord, I pray that you would lead and guide and protect them. Lord, I pray that you would work with, uh, that you would lead and guide Nate and Rochelle and Chet and Katie and the Yost and everyone else who interacts with them on a more regular basis. Lord, would you equip them and supernaturally protect and guard them and lead and guide them as they love and serve and guide this people. They're not theirs. They, these are your people. We pray. And these, and these are our people in the sense that they are our brothers and sisters in Christ. We thank you, Lord, that we are all a part of the family of God. And that one day we will all, just like I talked to a number of the guys, that one day we'll be able to talk and understand one another and we'll be able to have fellowship in Christ at a heart level. 
Lord, I we long for that day. I pray for Maniwa. I pray for Nepo, especially as they're leading this new fledgling group. Lord, I pray that you would watch over them, lead God and protect them. Give them insight into your word. Fill them with your spirit. And I pray you would raise up others just like them. And Lord, that you would be exalted in their midst, even as we pray you would be exalted in ours. Father, we love you and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, let's celebrate together as we conclude by singing, I will glory in my Redeemer.